Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing very, very well. Um, happy Wednesday. Um, today we're joined by a, an awesome Shift Success client and friend who's been with us, I believe, around about a year so far. And he's going to be sharing his story from police officer to entrepreneur, his ups and downs uh, in his business journey, but also in his policing career. And uh, he's going to be sharing lots of inspiration for you going forward. So without any further ado, Jay Gurria, how are you doing? I'm okay. Yourself, Alex? I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. So welcome to the show. And one of the first kind of questions I always like to ask everyone is, um, you know, what was it like for you growing up for a kid and where are you from? So initially, um, grew up in Birmingham. Um, parents obviously came over from India and Kenya. Um, I was four years old when we sort of moved to Leicester. And um, parents obviously moved over for work reasons. Mm -hmm. Birmingham was a good place. I don't remember much of it. Yeah. Um, but then we moved over to, to Leicester. Um, I remember we used to move into this little flat that was sort of shared um, with other people initially when we sort of moved over. So that's my sort of first uh, memories of, of moving over to Leicester. Awesome. Amazing stuff. And kind of what was you kind of like as a kid? Was you, you know, was you the naughty one? Was you the academic one? Was you the, the, the geek? What was you kind of growing up? Growing up, I was, I was the naughty one, basically. Um, yeah. All I like doing is playing football, um, meeting up with friends, and most of my time I used to spend either at play scheme or um, in the park playing football. I wasn't, I wasn't one of the academic ones, um, and I think, I think I found it, I found it boring, um, yeah. so I couldn't just sit in one place and learn um, what I needed to, you know, sort of thing, so... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what did you grow up in like a big family or was it quite a small family? Or uh, my family was pretty big, um, including cousins. I've got two sisters who are younger than myself. Um, one yep. works for the police and the other's a estate agent as well. Um, so oh, two younger sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was I was the older one. Nice, nice. So obviously, as a as a young kid, did you have kind of a you know a career set out for you in terms of I want to be this when growing up or was you kind of just winging it as you, as you grew up? Um, initially you have your career days and things and you think, what can you do? That's going to be interesting. Right. Um, mm. And two things that stuck out for me was the police um, watching the bill and all that. And also being a pilot, that was another exciting thing that you go out and you do things. Right. So yeah. Yeah. I never really saw myself as one that could just sit in front of a computer. Um, so yeah. I did used to think, what am I going to do as a job when I sort of leave school and things like that? Yeah. So he was having those kind of thoughts as you was going through school, thinking about, you know, what am I going to do after school? And, and, and the two for you was pilot or police officer. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. And kind of what, and you know, we'll go on to the kind of your policing career in a bit, but what kind of, what happened to kind of the pilot inside of the idea? Did you just like choose the police because it's something different or? Um, I was watching the bill like most people yeah. did and yeah. police programs. I thought this is very interesting. I thought I could, I could do this. Right. And I would like right, to okay. do this. Um, yeah. So that's why I sort of went towards that direction. And I think the other thing was also, yeah. that you, you had to sort of get certain qualifications to become a pilot, right? Oh, and, yes. at, and at that point, at the age of like 15, 16, I used to, mm. you know, not study much. And I used to just like to go out and, and do things more practical. So I think that's what pushed me into the police side of things. Yeah, it makes sense. I think with it, like with an airline pilot, you've got to have so many hours of airtime as well. And that's, that's yeah. very expensive to rack up. Like that's a big cost, right? Yeah. But the other thing, the other thing that sort of opened my eyes, because my parents always used to say, you need to study, you need to study. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing the GCSEs and I, and I knew, I knew I was going to fail them. Right. I just knew it. So yeah. I remember, I remember, I still remember that morning, 10 o'clock results were going to come out and police Academy had come out that, that day. Right. Mm -hmm. And I got my results and it was fail, 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 fail for everything, right? Including some of my friends as well. And, and at that moment in time, I kind of had a bit of a realization. And I thought to myself, you know, my parents have been telling me for a long time, you need to study, you need to study. But it didn't really sort of dawn on me until I got my results, right? 
And I looked at the clock and I thought, I've got eight hours until uh, parents come home from work. And yeah. I've had it. I've had it, basically. Yeah. You know, dad, dad would be really angry. <laughs> yeah. Get a beating for, for <laughs> failing everything. So enjoyed the rest of the day. And obviously, I came home at like six o'clock, six, seven o'clock. And obviously, as usual, you'd get told off, mm. which I did. And then I thought to myself, you know what? You need to do something about it. So I did retake everything. Right. Okay. I passed. Right, oh. I did pass. <laughs> I passed his GCSEs. Yeah. Went on, went on to my A levels. I thought I will, I will get my A levels. Then I did pass them as well. So, oh. You know. Um, that's good. You went, so you went back and actually redid them, which is amazing. Yeah, because I thought, you know what, you do need. It's that realization that came to me. It came a bit late, you know, after yeah. I failed. Um, but when it did come, I kind of realized that you do need to get these done. And, and I did sort of knuckle down and concentrate. And I, I had the ability to do it, which I realized later. Um, but it was just wanting to, you know. Yeah, I, I can remember. I can remember very clearly, actually, GCSE day. And um, everyone was opening it up. Everyone was opening up there. They had like an envelope that, w- that was going around. Yeah. All up an envelope. And I opened in it. And I wasn't so scared of what my parents would say or my family would say but it was almost like when everyone else was opening up their their letters and they were getting like a's b's even c's yeah. and i'm there with d's and e's it made me feel bad then knowing yeah. that they had got that now i don't know if that was competitiveness and what because i didn't take my gcse serious at all no. um and no one was really saying study 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 at the same time and then that dawned on me then that day actually now you say it uh, something triggered in me like oh, i wish i did study i yeah. don't know what it was it was like a it was like almost like i really wish i did knuckle down now was it worth it and it was almost like this slight panic of what am i going to do now now school's finished i'm not going back what what is what's the next step and for me i went to as levels but then i dropped out of as levels i just couldn't stand i, I realized i just couldn't I didn't like being in the school. I didn't like being in the kind of that educational system. And um, yeah, it just dawned on me like, what am I going to do? And then I panicked and started wondering, you know, what's next? What's next? And I, I'm assuming you had that feeling as well. But for you, you went back and actually got your grades, which is a, you know, reassurance. Yeah. I mean, it's all good. What I realize is it's all good people telling you, you need to do this, you need to do this. You know, mm-hmm. the amount of times my parents told me, because they were big in education, because they obviously weren't that educated. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't take much notice of it personally, but it was only when it hits you at that moment in time, like you said, other people open their results and you open your results and you think, mm. what is this, right? Yeah. Um, you, you know, you, you can't sort of have this like this. And that's yeah. the first sort of realization, which is like, or change, change something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So even if you don't want to do it, do it and get it done. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm with you on that. Process after, yeah. For sure. So you went to GCSEs, then you obviously went into A levels. Was the next step university for you? Did you want to go to university or? So I was working part time um, whilst with Open University because law was one of my favourite topics. Right, okay. um, I passed all that, and I was it was a strong point for me because it was interesting. Yeah. So I started some of my degree with Open University, but then at the same time I wanted to join the police as well. Mm-hmm. So as I joined the police, I sort of stopped off the degree i didn't finish it right okay okay and you you know was that just because was it the change i know you said that you know you had (laughs) trouble with like gcses and stuff because it's a big decision to go to university and and start it what what changed what was the big thing was it Um, initially back then um i passed my levels had no issues with i enjoyed law um and parents uh you know you need to get a degree, you need to get a degree. So I'm like, you know what, I like law. So let me um, study that. And as I was studying that, I thought, I want to make progress within the police as well. Right, okay. And then I sort of realised that you don't need a degree for everything. Like, I'm going to do this law degree, but am I going to use it? You know, am Mm. I going to go down the path of becoming a solicitor stuff, which I wasn't, right? So why am I wasting my time is what I thought. Mm. Um, And then I sort of left that and then moved, moved towards the police, basically. Got you. Okay. So, so this, how old are you at this stage? I'm 41. So, sorry, back when you was doing your, um, in twenties, twenties. Cool. And obviously you wanted to progress things in the police, which is amazing. How old was you when you actually joined the police and was it your first job? Um, I turned 21. Right. When I joined basically. That's really young. 
Yeah, yeah, 1021. But it wasn't my first job, which is another okay. thing. All right. Uh, basically, during, while well, I was about 16 years old, um, during the summer holidays, obviously didn't really do much. And I, I remember dad coming into my room saying, listen, you've got two weeks. You need to be doing something constructive, get yourself a job or whatever. Yeah. I remember thinking, he's just bluffing. I can do what I want for eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> sort of thing so after about a week and a half I remember half six in the morning he wakes me up and he goes you're coming with me I'm like okay so I went with him take me to his work so he was a warehouse manager which he looked after quite a few warehouses and those warehouses had those really big roles those heavy fabric roles and whatnot he says you're going to be moving these so I'm like okay so obviously after the first day of moving I'm like this is tiring yeah he was serious and this is this went on for about five weeks yeah right um and then i thought i need to sort of find something because he's serious so what i did is i was working at a friend's restaurant they were all sort of interconnected the businesses where dad was working so i was working at the restaurant um and working at the factory part-time because i said listen i've got a job now so i'm doing this Mm -hmm. um and then i thought after after that because i used to work from seven in the morning till six and then i used to be able to come home and go and play football you know so i never even Um, used to see my friends yeah Um, and that was eye-opening because that is what he wanted me to kind of realize this is hard work yeah right yeah he's trying to just still probably like a a lesson in that right oh it was a good lesson because after football used to come back and used to go to sleep because i knew in the morning i'd have to go back with it with them Mm -hmm. right um and after doing that for a few years as soon as i turned 18 um so after the summer holiday i stopped with the factory work it was just part-time at the restaurant Mm -hmm. and when i turned 18 i started working for shell basically interesting okay um so when i went what was you doing Shell? so i was basically just um on the till okay Um, yeah i looked i looked after the whole sort of garage yeah um, the runnings of it the fuel side of it and the shop side of it got you um and when i went to apply for the job it was obviously one of my i didn't realize but one of my friends who i knew used to play football with he actually um they kind of he ran it so as a mm. manager there um so, so that was good and I, and I stayed there for about three years um before joining the police basically cool okay amazing so that was so you had basically one job before you joined the police yeah. um and at this time you're 21 years old joined the, the job um what was those like kind of what's kind of your first impression of the police when you first joined was it exciting was it like was you nervous what was your kind of first impression because 21 is a very young age um initially i was excited at it thinking you know this is a police service this is you know it's something one of the things that i've always wanted to do and you know my first initial experience of the police was you know this is organization it's disciplined everything you do um and it was fun sort of interacting with people but i think myself personally i wasn't mature enough to understand mm. you know how to even communicate with people on in a, in a certain way so you have to change the way you're talking to people and you're young which which makes you kind of vulnerable to, yeah, to yeah. people basically and and at that point you know my confidence wasn't like super high or anything so it's like yeah. I used to sort of question myself and but as time went on you get a bit more confident you know with, mm, with, yeah, with what yeah. you're doing um yeah or, as your experience builds you, you get more confident right yeah yeah mm. and the life skills i think yeah we, sorry carry on yeah the life skills um you don't realize how important it is to be able to just in general communicate with people before you even do something like this so i didn't have that knowledge beforehand well yeah i mean i, I remember applying for the job when i was 18 and i, I literally had <laughs> zero experience i think my i think my first job was boots in victoria center in nottingham uh got rejected the application which it you know, expected right 18 i had zero, like zero going for me and my examples are really crap in the application form and yeah it wasn't good um and obviously being in 21 you know it's not much older than 18 you got in and you start realizing actually you, you do need these skill sets but as you said the more you the more you learn and the more you experience you become and the more confident you become um did you uh get any shit for being that young like did you any get any like like shit from the public for being so young and arresting people yeah yeah, yeah. i found i found that quite a bit um you know you'd be on the night out in town 
And I remember, you know, <clears throat> older men would say things, even women, right? Um, you know, I remember walking, walking down and someone pitching my bum, right? And I'm 20 years old. So I looked at my colleague and he looks at me. I mean, he must have been about in his 40s. And he goes, he goes, that's for you to say something, not me like that. And I looked at him and I thought, this is my first experience and you're young and it's like, what do you do? You know, your first sort of um, experience of things like that and people sort of talking down on you, what do you know? And you sit there and you, you're just listening to this um, and you yeah. kind of deal with it the best you can, but there's a lot of things that go on in terms of the way people even perceive you, you know, when you're standing there and, and how Beautiful. much respect they have for you just because you're that young, if that makes sense. And I only yeah. see that now when I was out with young colleagues, how other people are talking to them in the mm. same way that they used to talk to me because yeah, of your yeah. age sometimes, you know, because now they're about 19, aren't they, when they join sometimes. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, older cops saying how how young uh, the new recruits are. Um, so for you, like, you know, being on the first year, is it Leicestershire Police, right? Leicester. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, being on being around the town Saturday night for your first shift, what was that kind of a you know from an age point of view you notice the difference of people talking to you but did you also know like a change in the energy around you wearing the uniform did you did you notice that at all yeah i mean just the fact that you've got that uniform on everybody expects you to sort of sort everything out any kind of issues any problems and i remember sort of feeling nervous thinking what if somebody comes up to me and asks me something and i don't know the answer to um, yeah. at that moment in time so whenever you turn up anywhere everybody's looking at you and they expect you to to sort it out right whatever the issue yeah. may be but what they don't realize is inside you're you're scared you know you are yeah. <laughs> you are scared of what may go on you know and you kind of hope you'd get through it yeah i think a lot of people forget that like cops are human beings and I think they just see the uniform and not the person behind who has emotions, who has feelings, who has, you know, fears. Um, yeah, I found that quite, quite interesting. And, and seeing that when I was working in custody, a lot of people just didn't, just didn't click on to the fact that all they saw was the police um, name. So, and what kind of roles did you do in the police? Um, so initially I joined I joined response at Welford Road Station that was where I was initially based as a, as a probationer um, and the, the area itself I mean they had some some decent areas but they had some pretty bad areas back then as well um, mm. that was that was my sort of first experience of frontline policing and I remember one time um, going to a domestic right and the person had actually come back to the house and there was only a door with a glass pane between me um my tutor and them and I remember just standing there being so scared thinking to myself what if this guy breaks in what do I do you know um they're the sort of initial initial sort of frontline roles that I had so Welford Road was one of them um and then after about two three years there I moved to sort of Spinny Hill which was sort of different demographic um in terms of the type of people that you're dealing with and how compact um, the area was. It was a, a large sort of um, amount of people within a, a compact area. And it sort of had its own sort of issues or different kind of problems to what we faced in, in the Welford Road area. Um, so I was based there for about seven years. Um, in between that time, you know, I did quite a few courses, you know, like you, you do a PSU course in my firearms driving, things like that. Yeah. Um, and then obviously I went back to Spinney Hill and then there were a few changes from there. I moved move station because the areas and whatnot had changed. So we went to Euston Street. And um, again, it was frontline policing for a long, long time. And it was all sort of shift work that I did. Um, then obviously they had the changes again due to budget cuts and whatnot. So um, a couple of us were sent to different departments and I was sent to headquarters basically. Um, this is when they had the rollout of Niche. Do you remember Niche? I program? remember Niche very clearly. Yeah, we had it yeah. in uh, Bridewell custody. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember Niche coming out and thinking, man, this is so difficult. Yeah. How am I going to learn it? But all of us got sent to headquarters and within a couple of days doing crime reports is all we did. And it was like we mastered all of that. Yeah. And after that point, um, we were working with civilians then um, as well. And after that point, a couple of us decided we need to kind of get out of this environment because mm -hmm. we've learned what we can and it's not the best environment to be yeah. in um, sort of thing. So then I basically 
2020, I moved to Kian Lane CID. Um, and initially things were things were fine there, right? Had no issues um, for a few years. No, 2017, I think it was. Yeah, we moved to Kiam Lane. Um, again, a few years, didn't have any issues again. And then in 2020, sort of ended up the worst time of my life. Um, you know, you, you go through periods where everything is fine. You get those little problems and then something big always within after a few years comes along, you know. Mm. Um, with supervisory and just being dragged into you know other people's sort of investigations that PSD were doing and I kind of felt a bit bit hard done mm. you know by what they'd done and, and how they'd done it um, as well as a few other issues with just just work itself you know they overload you and still expect you to sort of produce everything but they don't care about sort of how you're feeling how it's affected you you know, and everything else. And I kind of, I kind of had enough, to be honest, at that point, I'm just like, you do everything you possibly can for them. Right. Um, but, you know, that's, that's when the realization came that they really don't care about you. Okay. It's my personal opinion, because I've seen others go through it. Mm. Right. And when I went through that, I thought to myself, you know, that some of this stuff that they're doing, they know it's wrong. Right. But they still carry on and they do it. For example, even with, with professional standards, it's like I got a warning as a result of just being in a car. And I thought to myself, you know what? That was just wrong what happened right, yeah. to me. Um, I'm the kind of person, if I've, if I've done something wrong, I always put my hands up. And even when I was tutoring, I always say, if you do something wrong, always admit to the fact that you've, you've done it and, yeah. and why you've done it, right? Because everybody makes those mistakes. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if you, if you think something's wrong, right? You're going to know automatically that this is not the right thing to do, right? Yeah. Um, sort of thing. So after that, I'm just like, you know what? I, I didn't care. You know, I just did not care. I did what I want. I rang in sick when I wanted to ring in sick, um, you know, worked on my business and stuff. And obviously they found out they didn't like that. Yeah. And, and when they spoke to me, I told them, I told them, yeah, I did it. You know, yeah. Um, I'd rather, I'd rather get in trouble for something I've done then get in trouble for something I haven't done. Completely. They, 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 they didn't like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think by this point, I had a switch in mindset as well. Um, mm. You know, after many years of just doing, 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 sort of, I think that was the last sort of straw for me personally, right? Others would have dealt with it differently, maybe. You know, I'm not saying it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, but, you know, in my book, I always said to them, if I had to do that again, I would do the same thing again right yeah um because you, of what you've done so it is what it is yeah yeah you back to your decision so so up until 2020 um how long was you in the job for at that point so i joined in 2002 18 years wow okay so a pretty long time and i'm i'm assuming in that time you've you know you've gave your life you've you know worked overtime when they want when you wanted to you've you've yeah. stayed on You've shift swaps, you've cancelled rest days, you've given your life to the job for 18 years. And, and the reason I say that is because, you know, we've spoke before, but also uh, many police officers do that for the job, right? So yeah. 2020, I mean, go into as much detail as you want, but what happened for you to go, hang on, this is not right? What happened? So... Number one, um, I was I was on I was on restricted duties at one point, right? I'd snapped my ACL playing football, and even though I'd snapped my ACL playing football, I still came into work on, on my crutches, right? And yeah. I remember sitting there doing work, and um, a week had gone by, and I thought I, I can now walk slowly. I need to kind of just get out and post something through a Greaves uh, letterbox. So I go to my colleague. I go. Um, is it okay if I jump in with you, a colleague of mine, really nice person? And he goes, yeah, no problems, whatever, you know? Um, I was in plain clothes. He had a plain car. And this is when the beast from the east was around. You remember the weather was really bad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he said to me, he goes, Jay, he goes, I need to drop some uh, some wood bags to my parents' house. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't think much of it. And I thought, okay, cool. That's no problems. So went out, did that, didn't think of it, anything of it. I dropped whatever I needed to to, to um, the Greaves house and the sort of came back and about five, six months later, he said to me, he goes, Jay, he doesn't need to speak to you. I'm like, hey, what's up? He goes, oh, PSD have served me so with misconduct paperwork. So I'm like, oh, okay, what for? And he goes, oh, because we went to drop the bag of logs from my parents' house. I'm like, oh, okay. I can't, didn't think about it, to be honest. So what had happened 
is where his parents lived, they had a bit of a dispute with the neighbours over parking the business that they had. And what the guy had done is he'd obviously had another problem and he complained about it. So I got a message from PSD to say, you know, what exactly had happened? So I obviously told them exactly what had gone on, why I'd gone out and, and, and the rest of it. And I said, yeah, I was there. So what they then did, they said they're not investigating me. After that, they said, moon misconduct paperwork, right? And I'm just sitting so there. Thinking, after saying they wasn't investigating you, they then served your papers. Yeah, they served me papers. And I just sat there. My colleague, he apologized to me for, I go, listen, I go, it's not your fault, right? I go, we don't control what they do and, and how they how they do things, right? Um, so they they wanted, so the PS, the police federation, when I spoke to them, they said to me, Jay, it is what it is. I'm like, what do you mean it is what it is? They go, just admit what you've done. You know, plead guilty. I'm like, plead guilty to what? Right? Um, and he goes, unless you want to get it, to, you know, get a, a bigger sanction, I would plead guilty. And they had a hearing for this, right? Jesus. And I just sat there and I'm like, yeah, guilty. They're like, oh, so what would you have taken back from this? And I'm like, well, next time, make sure that my colleague's got permission to drop those pieces of wood off to his parents. Right? His, his parents are in their 90s, they're so old, right? Yeah. And that person was obviously sitting there who made a complaint about my colleague. And I thought, Do you know what? This is wrong, right? Mm. So wrong. In in 20 years of being the police, I've never been in trouble for anything, anything at all, other than the usual complaints people make, right? And yeah, you sit yeah. there and I think, if I make a mistake, I own it. I will always say I made that mistake. You know, that's just me. Um, you know, you've got to have that certain character about yourself when you're doing certain things. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and my colleague, you apologise to me. I go, listen, don't worry. And that, as well as that going on, there was some bullying and stuff from the supervisor going on. Um, even with myself. the amount, yeah, with myself, and even the amount of workload that they sort of allocate to me was more than the other. So what I did is I had a timeline of everything that went on, right? And I thought I know what they're trying to do now, because um, there was a couple of officers working on the same supervisor previously who had to move because of their behaviour, the mm. sergeant and the inspector. Um, and I just remember that after this hearing that had gone on and everything that had gone on with just the bullying side. I mean, I remember coming to work here. Yeah, I wasn't feeling too well. I had a fever and I don't know what I'd eat. And I must have diarrhea. I had to go to the toilet a couple yeah. of times and I go to her, oh, I need to go home. I go, can I have time off or whatever? She's like, no, you've got too much work to do. And I remember, you know, I'm sick. I don't normally go off sick, even though I've, I, I, I hurt my leg. I still came into work the yeah. day after the injury, yeah. right? And that was just the, some of the stuff. So I put a grievance in, right? I've got a 70, 80 page document in terms of what had gone on. Yeah. And they had to basically find out, they had to find in the grievance that they were at fault. But what they did is they basically said it was departmental failures, right? Mm. And I sat there and I think you've done all of this to me, including loads of other things, right? When I've told you that these are the issues and then you basically bury this yeah. issue by saying it's departmental failures, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I thought to myself, this is just, you know, this is just one of those things that I'm not going to win, um, even though the fact that they've said, yeah, okay, it is depart it's not a departmental failure. It's them that's done this to me, yeah, right? Yeah. And they knew exactly what they've done to me as well as cancelling a couple of courses that I'd arranged as well. Yeah. But you know, normally when they when, when you get emails saying your course has been allocated to you, it's got a name, or been cancelled, it's got a name, it didn't have a name. I had to email to find out, and it was a sergeant who'd cancelled it, right? Mm. You know, and it was just things like that they do behind the scene. And I thought to myself, that's it now. I got I went off sick, and I said to them, I'm not coming back to work until I move, right? Um, they tried to make out that I was incompetent is what they tried to do. And in all these years, guess what? Nobody's ever said I'm incompetent, mm -hmm. right? Um, if I was, there would be, um, there'd be action plans. Certain, yeah, yeah. There'd be, not only would there be action plans, but there'd be, you, when someone's incompetent, they don't just, it's not just a one-off, it's continuous, yeah. right? Um, none of that basically and what they did is they tried to give me an action plan and it wasn't for it was for sickness it wasn't for um being incompetent they tried to upp one me right and i thought you've got no evidence to even do that right 
Um, but I appealed it and it got overturned. And I basically said, I'm not going to be working under these supervisors. So when you decide to let me move to any, any other station, then I've got to come back to work, which then I think they were in a corner. So what they did is they basically moved me to uh, Bomber East Police Station. Yep. And, you know, I told the sergeant, I go, this is the reason I'm here. I go, whatever they've said to you, you know, um, you'll see the work that I do. And not only did I excel in the work that I did, right, I looked after the probation officers as well that were within my sort of shift in terms of tasks, you know, tasks from CPS, things like that, as well as doing my work. What that basically meant is um, if I was on a 2 p.m. shift till 11 at night, I used to come in at 12, right? And I used to catch up with everything for those two hours, prep, and then start because you knew at two o'clock you would be getting more work coming your way as well as what you've already got. Yep. Um, and I worked there for a year, right? Guess what? No issues. Mm. Nothing even highlighted, right? And mm. if you read all the PDRs, it's like, how come, you know, I can't see any problem with you? I'm like, there is no problem. But when somebody wants to try and manage you out, wants to cause you a problem, um, they can easily make that up in a certain way on paper. And, and, and Yeah, they and, can manipulate you know, it, right? Yeah. But the thing is, the evidence for itself that I had showed that that was not the case, you know? And I thought to myself, I kind of got to a point where I started not really caring right i didn't care yeah i used to bring in sick whenever you know i used to even joke about it saying i've got annual leave i've got rest days and i've got sick days i got the only thing left now is to call in dead right <laughs> <laughs> and i'd laugh about it and and, and and you know people that i spoke to are just like you're crazy and until they found out they did a hearing got interviewed i basically said to them um yeah i go and you know they didn't like the fact that i sat in that interview and said and you know what you know, yeah. I have rang in sick. Yeah. This is the reasons, and you all deserve it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they didn't like that that kind of answer, did they? They didn't, because I, I suppose not many people would say that to them. No, some of the people that I spoke to, um, they go to me, I don't think anybody would say something like that to, because PSD and then they kind of think, you know, we can do whatever we want. And I sat there, I said, I don't need you. I don't need the job. And if I was to do this again, I would do the same thing over and over again. I would call in sick. And guess what? I'd tell you I've done it, right? Wow. They didn't know what to say. They just sat there. They didn't know what to say. And it's not it's not arrogance. You know, I'm never, never an arrogant person, never have been, even with anybody that I've dealt with, know that I'm most chilled out person. But you stood up for yourself. Yeah, I, yeah. And even now, you know, some people may say it was the wrong thing to do, but I would still do the same again. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, I would still do the same again because they need to understand. I said to them, you need to change. I didn't I did give them feedback. I said, you need to change the way you treat officers. I'm just one of them. I said, the difference is I don't rely on your wages, right? Yeah. Um, at all. So they didn't like that. I had my resignation. I know, I said, I know that when you go to this hearing, mm. um, I'm probably going to be dismissed anyways. I go, but it doesn't make a difference to me because it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. Um, handed my resignation to them. I said, see you later you know and just just to add to that yeah um, what i've done is just going i'm just going to move slightly forward with something so i sure. left my job in december right i didn't get paid for it right yeah, yeah so from december to march now right i've managed to get 30 more properties on my books right okay wow. and the 10 flats coming at about 440 a month and the 20 houses coming at 1,408. So my take home from the police was about 2,500, 2,600, right? Because I pull out the pension. My take home just from, from December, end of, no, let's say January to, to, to March is 1,848 pounds. So I'm only about 700 pounds less than what I would have earned in the police right now, just with, from this year alone. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it's it's an amazing thing, Jay. It really, really is. And what you know, what I'm getting from this story is that you know you stood for something, and because you're not reliant on the police wage, you had that get out. So if, you know, when when I got an issue in custody with an angry naked detainee covered in feces, right? I I said I'm not I don't want to go back, and I didn't, and I went sick, and then I resigned. Um, but the key thing is, is that I had that business there, which means I wasn't actually reliant on the police income. I had my secondary income, so to speak, so that the transition was smooth. Um, just going back to when this all going on in 2020 for you, you know, 
what do you think the deep reasons were they were trying to push you out? What what would you think it was? Just didn't want you on the team anymore? Was it because of the PSD issue? What was um, it? With the PSD issue, I think it was just the fact I was in the wrong place at the wrong time is, is what it was, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. At what point do you think, if I'd known that, if I'd even paid attention to know, you know when someone's doing something wrong, right? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, you yeah. know it's wrong and it's like, listen, this is wrong. You need to do this or this. But when someone says to you, I just need to go and drop some logs up to your pen. You don't really think that of you course. need to do this, this, and this, right? Yeah. Um, and he goes to me, yeah, my parents, he goes, it's slippy outside, you know, there was ice and stuff. And I'm like, I get it, right? Yeah, yeah of course, um, it's common logic. I mean, how many people have done things and gone pick things up, right? Hundreds yeah. of people do it, right? Yeah. Um, if, I'd, if I'd known that this would have happened in hindsight, I would have said, you need to just get permission from a sergeant. And guess what? Sergeant wouldn't have said no, right? Yeah. I don't think any supervisor yeah. within reason, even if he said, um, take half an hour off, go and do it and come back, whatever yep. that, that was, right? But I didn't see anything wrong in it. No, no. Um, so with that, it was wrong place at the wrong time. And I think that with PSE, they could have dealt with it differently, mm. right? They could have said, you know what? Okay, you've done it. But you know what? Just, just a verbal warning. Just this is what you need to do next time, right? And they didn't need to put me through a whole hearing, right? No. With my colleague for that to make me look like I've done something wrong. But as you say, they were like, they, like, you felt like they were pushing you out. And yeah, why do you think that was like out of your current role? What um, on with, with the supervisor, I just, I don't, I don't know if they didn't take, take to me or mm. what. Um, under that inspector, there was a couple, I mean, this is, this is my own, own research that I've done in the, in the Asian officers that I spoke to. Yeah. three of them had moved under the same supervisor they had to right. move right? right i was the fourth one so right. think of it what you will yeah um but it takes a lot for someone like myself to to be sort of of course you yes. know ringing in sick and 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 put a grievance in i've never put in a grievance like this to um to this extent if that makes sense yeah of course okay um so you met, obviously you resigned congratulations and you okay. stood up for yourself which i think is very noble um yeah. and the transition was very smooth for you because you already were in business so do you want to explain for those uh who may not know what you do what you actually do in now in business um so i've got my own estate agency which i opened in like 2011 2012 and mm -hmm. what we did is we were just basically managing properties um yeah. you know um management of houses um flats any blocks anything like that um even hmos if they, if they came in anything that did come in yeah so i think is, is what i do um as well as we specialize in evictions as well now right um yeah. Yeah. and um more recently maintenance is another big thing for us that we kind of got pushed into yeah um which again doing really well with amazing amazing um so 2012 you kind of started this i'm assuming it was a bit of a side business while she was in the job um and obviously you've built this up over time and i think you joined shift success about maybe a year ago something like a year and a half ago yeah i think i joined you guys sort of september last year yeah it was i tried wow. you know a couple of months with you guys and then i then i sort of signed up um yeah. with you guys um, but yeah okay and um like that, you know, 11 from 2012 to, to now is, is a long period. What did you make the transition from side business to this is my ticket out when this is all going on in the job for you in 2020, this kind of stressful. Era? So what happened, what happened with myself is while I was in the police, I kind of realized I didn't have enough money. Right. Yeah. Um, and I remember sitting there at like three o'clock in the morning thinking, you know, what could I do? right yeah um because what i did is i did buy my first house when i just turned 21 as well and that yeah. was like an investment and i sold it and within a year i'd made something like twenty five thousand pound um wow. just out of that one house right yeah but the thing with me was um i wasn't savvy with money right mm -hmm. so what i did is just wasted and spent it and and then i sort of sat there and I'm thinking, you know what, I've only got this much amount of money, I had to sort of budget with what I was doing, all my spending, because, you know, the only income I had back then was with uh, the police. Yeah, it wasn't a large amount. 
yeah. and my spending was obviously much more than my income, right? Mm. So I'm like, I, sat, I remember three o'clock in the morning, I'm like, what can I do? What can I do? And I remember thinking, I've already done properties and I enjoy it, right? Yeah. So I thought, open up an agency. So at three o'clock in the morning, I got out of bed yeah. and I bought a URL, yeah. right? Um, a dead properties, that was the name. Yeah. And I bought that URL and I, and I was happy and I went back to bed, right? And I thought, I'll work on this in the morning, yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. So that's how the idea sort of came about. Wow. So basically, it wasn't, you know, you want more money. The logical, obviously, thought, start your own business, right? Not only that, but the other things that happened back then was yeah. um, I remember joining the police on a pension thinking I'll work 30 years. And after I've worked 30 years, guess what? I'll be able to retire on the pension. Everything could be good. Yeah. And then they start talking about changing the pension, right? Yeah. You yeah, need yeah. to work longer hours for a longer amount of years and you pay more into your pension and you get less back. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't be running after people when I'm 60 years old, right? Yeah. Um, and not only that, that's when they started changing our shifts and that's so you're working longer. The hours were even more antisocial, right, than they are now with back-to-back hours. And I remember um, we came into brief once and basically we we're hit with that recession, yeah. right, 2010-11. And this inspector walked in that, I didn't know who he was. And there was like, back then, there was like everybody in one briefing room. There'd be about 30, 40 of you, but you'd cover the whole of Leicestershire sort of central area. Mm-hmm. I remember him saying, oh, well, this is how it's going to be. Like it or lump it is basically what he said. In his, in his Not in those terms, but he's basically saying, get used to it, it's going to get worse. Mm. And this is when there were places like um, shops where there were basically... Um, making people redundant, other jobs, you know, redundant um, because of the recession. And he's basically trying to say that, you know what, you're lucky you've got a job. So do what, you know, we need you to do. Mm. I remember after he left thinking, man, you know, such a wrong thing to say to these people and demotivating, right? Yeah. Um, Sort of thing. And I thought to myself, you need to do something. So that's when I pulled out my pension, right? I pulled out my pension. So in 2010, you put out your pension. Yeah, 2010, or just before that, I pulled out my pension, right? And I thought, I can invest this money yeah. um, because I started getting more savvier with my spending and everything. And what I'd yeah. done is I'd, I'd paid off as much of my debt as I could. Yeah. Um, and I started becoming very clever with my money. So I started putting more aside. So all my pension I put aside, basically. Wise. Um, very wise. Yeah. yeah, very. I think... I'm yet to meet a police officer who lives, who is retired, who lives off the pension alone. Yeah. Uh, like a, 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 a police officer who's retired now. I think they're always doing something. They're always like, you've got another job or they've got a part-time job or they're in business because the pension isn't enough. No. Um, and obviously the pensions change over the time. Um, yeah. But also that's the financial element. I think from a mindset point of view, speaking to many, many cops, the pension becomes this crux. And for me and for you, obviously, and other people who have come out of the pension, it's like, for what? This this pension isn't good um, nah. and there's better vehicles out there, but more so people are so scared to make a change of the pension um, for whatever reason, for, for the fear of, you know, working till they die. But the reality is they're going to have to do that anyway because the pension is not enough. Um, and I think a lot of people who've came out of the pension during the service have felt almost like the invisible handcuffs have come off them. They felt like um, there's nothing timey here as much anymore. Did you experience that when you come out of the pension? Yeah, when I came out of the pension, I was one of the first to make that decision, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember people saying, but why, you know, you get this. <laughs> Even my parents said to me, but why? Because after all these years, you will yeah. get a good pension back. Yeah, I'm thinking I don't want to be here 30 years no. or 35 years because by the time my pension's due, I don't know one, I don't know if I'm going to be alive, right? Very true. Yep. And number two, I don't know what the changes are going to be, and you can see as of now how bad it actually is. Yes. So the decision I made back then, right, has served me really well because what I was able to do is save that money and just buy a house, put it on rent, save again, buy a house, put it on rent, yeah. um, remortgage the first one and buy another one or two houses right 
Um, and the tenants, my, my model was the tenants would pay that off, right? Yeah. I didn't need to worry about it. I just need to make sure I've got the right people in the right houses and they would pay those houses off. So even after I retire at any point, right? Even if I sold one of those houses off, right? I would probably make about 330,000 just on one. Which is more and than the pension. Which is more than, which is probably three, four times more than the yeah. pension would be. Yeah. And with the other rentals, I'll still be making how yeah. much a month, right? Yeah. And but and the that, thing that's is, not even your business, right? That you told their investments. So that's investments. And yeah. the other thing is, I wouldn't even need to sell any. I wouldn't sell anything, right? Yeah. Um, because of the way that the properties are, I could just live on the rental of it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, even now, if I wanted to just lay back with the business and live off the rental, I can because yeah. of all the hard work that I did beforehand right yeah yeah yeah. um because it wasn't just uh the estate agent that i opened up i thought what other skills have i got that i can use and driving instructing came to mind yeah so i qualified as a driving instructor Mm -hmm. i did my own students and i also worked for another company right who who my fees were reasonable right Um, when when was this driving instructor stage when was this in your career Um, this was this was like a year after i'd opened the agency Got you. Right. Okay. So like so 2013, like, maybe? Yeah, something like yeah. that. And I'm like, I need to, I need to do something more. Right. Um, and I and I did that. And I was not only teaching my students, I was teaching students for, for other companies which basically source students. So they'll do um block bookings mm-hmm. um where they do whatever amount of hours for just say 500 pounds or, or or something like that. So it would be like you'd be doing about six, seven at six hours in the car. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sort of teach ADIs as well, because when the check tests and stuff come around, you've got to basically pass them. You can only fail them once. So I did that for a few years and obviously saved up. And then I thought to myself, you are exhausting yourself now, mm. right? So from work to the agency, to the driving, you need to sort of let something go. And then I sort of let the driving go. Yeah. And then it was the agency and the police that I sort of concentrated on. But for quite a few years, I even went part-time in the police. Um, I was doing like 20 hours and people are like, you just come and go as you please, right? <laughs> I'm thinking, you don't realize the amount of work I've got to do outside of work, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, sort of thing. So, and then what I do is if it got really busy at work, I'll, I'll come back for five, 10 hours more. Sort yep. of thing. So I had that flexibility um, between the two. Yep. Awesome. Um, over, over the last seven, eight years. Yeah. Amazing. Absolutely amazing stuff. So um, your business now, obviously you've resigned from the job and you're in business full time. What's that been like for you? You know, knowing that, you know, the last shift you work and you go to bed that night, wake up in the morning thinking, I don't need to, you know, get myself on duty how did, how did you feel what, what was that experience like for you um it was almost like i slept in <laughs> really? I, I slept in I, I woke up i woke up at 11 12 o'clock thinking i can do what i want right that, that yeah. is the honest feeling is i remember waking up right thinking i can do whatever i want right yeah. within reason because i'm yeah. thinking to myself as long as i've got my houses that i need to rent and everything's on point i can a couple of days i can do whatever i want yeah um and i literally just sort of relaxed um and sort of prepped just uh in terms of how i'm going to bring the business forward right and obviously i joined shift for success a few months beforehand yeah and before i joined you guys i would i would be even if i thought you know for the whole year if i got 50 properties that would be super amazing right yeah but for me back then it would be super amazing but obviously meeting yourself and all the success stories of how much hard work people have put in, right? And what they've gained out of this, you know, even people that I know who have come to shift to success, um, like Kathleen yeah. Thompson and people like that, Dave, Tony Cliff, their stories are amazing, you know? And I love the fact that they're able to go from what they were doing to doing this and, and being so successful, right? It's so good. And my mindset, change from 50 properties to you know what i'm going to try and get 100 this year is was my aim and the fact that it's march and i've got to 30 right it's just a shift in the mindset and all the help from you and and the community it's been amazing and just the excitement you know i know that even now with the ones that i rent out i know more will be coming my way right Mm. um and when i'm able to fully sort of 
push myself into the process and do the stuff I need to do, it will get even busier and better. So yeah. it's been really exciting, personally. Mm-hmm. Amazing. I appreciate that. So in total, like how, how many properties do you manage in total, would you say? So right now I've got, I think, just a little over 130. 130 you manage? Ish, yeah, just wow. over, over that much. Yeah. That is getting big. Congratulations. Yeah. That is Thank amazing. You. Do, you, do yeah. you look back, you know, so you've been in business since 2013 to now, which is a good chunk of time. Do you look back from your policing career, uh, 18 years or 20 years that you're in and think, you know, um, which has been a better ride for you? Like, like which has been the better payoff? Um, in terms of financially, right, um, the business has, right? Yeah. But in terms of the knowledge, um, the experience, and, and as a person who it's basically made me into somebody who would not give up, right? And if something's difficult now, it doesn't phase me, right? I will do what I need to because I know there'll be a way around it, whatever that may be, Mm. right? Um, So it's turned me into a person who's very resilient and very strong now. I wouldn't say I was like that when I joined or a couple of years in. And the other thing that I think is, I think some of the bad stuff that I went through within the police service, right, especially the last few years, had turned me into sort of, I'm not emotional about it, right? Yeah. And I'm not going to cry or be a victim, be their victim is my mentality, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep on pushing, right? And pushing and pushing um, is my mentality. So I love that. I love that. So, so what you're saying is that these skills that you've built within the police yeah. have, have helped you in the business world from resilience to a mindset that when things go wrong, you don't panic, you're level-headed, you're calm and you push through. And they're the skills that you need as a police officer too, right? Yeah. And one of, one of the major ones, I remember doing the eviction once and I remember going to this house, knocking on the door and the guy actually came to the door with a bat, right? Mm. And he's shouting and he's swearing and I'm just standing there. I'm thinking, is this guy going to hit me, right? Yeah, Jesus <laughs> I just Christ. remember standing thinking, I don't want to get hit. Okay, if he hits me, yes, I'll deal with it. But yeah, And I basically said to him, I'm here to help you, I said, right? I go, I know you've got problems in the house and what's going on. And I managed to turn it around after about 10, 10 minutes. And I listened to about five minutes of his abuse and his threats. And I just stood there and I didn't do anything. Yeah, And just that fact of being able to stand there and diffuse it just by talking to him, right, is is one of the major skills that officers have got, you know, their communication, right? And they don't Mm -hmm. realize um, how important that is, you know? Um, Because some of these things that happened to me, and I look back at it, I think that could have ended pretty badly, right? (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) Sort of thing, but it didn't. And it's like, why didn't it? Maybe because I sort of, Bought him on the side. I managed to deal with him, and I finally sorted the bits out. I managed to get rid of him, right? Yeah. And I knew it was going to be a bit of a, a journey, right? Yeah. But I still got there at the end, and I thought, okay, that's gone now. The problem's gone. I can concentrate on renting this, dealing with this, and, and that's yeah. another one of my books, sort of thing. So true. Communication is a very big one. It, it drips into like what you got there as well as like persuasion, and yeah. like that. I think a lot of police officers have because you have to like use your communication to calm people down get a result that you want so it doesn't hurt them doesn't hurt you and i think that is often forgot about because it doesn't just when people hear about communication they just mean talking to people but it's actually in what environment so yeah i've always said a lot of police officers are amazing salespeople. they know how to speak to people they know how to um use their body language in a certain way um and also things like you know being organized like if you've got a customers to deal with you're going to be on time you're going to show up you're going to follow up and all these things that a lot of general public just don't have um so i'm glad you shared those um so who would you say is your typical customer i'm assuming landlords and, and landlords who don't want to deal with property issues yeah majority are, are landlords and i tend to find majority of my landlords are also sort of over the 30 year age right yeah. and i haven't had anybody who's been super young that i've dealt with um, or it'd be their sort of sons or daughters who'll say, you know, my parents have got this, you know, can you deal with this? Or we've got these problems that are, that are sort of coming about. And they would be my sort of ideal sort of 
customers mm. or even, even landlords. And when they come to you, because, you know, I'm a landlord myself and we have a large portfolio of HMO properties. Yeah. For those listening and, you know, maybe considering this type of business to get involved in, what kind of problems do your landlords come to you with um, that want to get rid of their properties and, and pass it to you? I think um, the ones that have come to me, some of, I do get landlords who will come to me who just say, Jake, can you sort of look after my house? Because I've looked after someone else's house and they're like, oh my God, you know, the tenants are so good. They look after the house and whatnot. So I think there's a couple of principles that I go by. Number one is any properties that I take over, right? The tenants, number one, they need to look after them. If it's empty and it's not up to standard, we make sure that it's done up nicely. So when tenants move in, they look after it. So we're very clear on the fact that what I expect from the tenants and what they can expect from me, if they've got a problem with anything, we will send the maintenance team around and get it done. Yeah. Um, because I make it a point of all maintenance comes through myself. Yeah. Right? So I know what's happening everywhere and it's done in a timely manner because last thing you want is the upkeep of those properties to then come down and down. Yeah. Because if you've got a property that isn't looked after, then guess what? You're not going to get the best people who want to move into that property. That's number one. Hundred times percent yeah. Um, I get... Uh, landlords complaining of non-payment by tenants or tenants mm. playing the so-called game that there's maintenance issues, you're not going to pay your rents and this and yeah. that, right? Um, and they want someone to just take the, the problem off their hands. Yeah. Um, evictions. And again, maintenance is a big, big, big issue with yeah. a headache for landlords as well. Yeah. And because some of them, they don't understand the legislation, they don't understand their rights or the tenants' rights. It's just like, you know what? We need to give it to somebody um, and a lot of my work does come from referrals because they've sort of yeah. had me deal with big problems and I've sorted them. And then what happens is they tell other people and then they'll call me yeah. and they'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, we can help you with this. Amazing. I love that. So basically you, you, and you know, I love it. You, you take away the headache that a lot of landlords get. Because I think there is this like stigma. Stigma is probably not the right word, but this kind of, I don't know, story out there in the general public that, there's a lot you know these there's a lot of bad lord landlords out there and there's rogue landlords which there is but there's also a lot of good landlords who want to do a good job who have a high standard of uh accommodation for their for their tenants and and basically with that unfortunately comes a lot of problems from tenant issues maintenance compliances government changes and you take all that pain away and you you handle that for them yeah yeah so that it sort of sorts um sorts out that issue for them because it's almost like they don't know what to do they keep on going back and forth with the tenants and sometimes tenants don't listen and i think when it comes from us it's a, or an agency it's a bit more official mm, yeah makes sense makes and also like it's like a buffer between like the tenant and the landlord when it's tenant and landlord it's sometimes it can get a bit debatey whereas yeah. if there's a buffer there so i've got a property manager and you know she deals with a lot of our issues and when it comes from her, it calms things down a little bit. It's like, I don't know, it just it's just a, a nice buffer that I find quite uh quite I good. always I always tell the landlords, once we take over, right, any communication from the tenants is to us. Yeah, yeah. You do not answer anything without yeah. letting us know, right? Yeah. Um, because what we don't like is you tell them something and then they say, Oh, the landlord said this. I'm like, any communication is strictly through us. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and guess what? It, it solves the problems, like you said. Yeah, yeah. Makes absolute sense. Hey, uh, Jake, what kind of, what's one of the biggest business lessons you've learned since being in business that you think would help some of the listeners? Um, Number one, don't, so from, from obviously joining you guys and seeing problems that people have had, one, one thing is just don't give up with what you're doing, mm-hmm. right? Don't, don't give up. Um, when I look at that for myself, it took me five months when I started to get my first property, mm. right? Um, so never give up with, with what, what, what idea you've got or what you're doing, right? Um, and don't expect sort of instant sort of results. It's yeah. not how it works, right? Um, mm. Some people sort of even look at me and think, oh, you're doing well. They don't realize it's taken me like the best part of 11 years to get where I am now, <laughs> yeah. right? You yeah. see what's happening now, but you've not seen all the failures, all the problems and, yep. and even the dark sort of places that you'll be in, yeah, alone, yeah. right? Um, and you have to get yourself out of that. And I think that's what sort of builds your resilience to mm. this. 
Um, so they're the bits of advice that I can sort of sort of offer. Yeah. And even with clients, you know, you're gonna gain some and you're going to lose some, right? You're not gonna make everybody happy, but you can't sit around there. I had to let you know when I first joined, I told you I had that 10 bedroom HMO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, after I got a couple of rooms, the landlord's like, oh, it's a bit too expensive. I let the whole thing go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I let him go and I'm like, I'm not spending my time wasting my time on that when I could be yeah. doing other things, right? Yeah. So don't be disheartened by by small failures and that. But if you carry on, you'll get to where you want to be. Yeah. You, 100%, you, yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, and you are saying, what well, you, you know, it's okay to sack customers. It's okay <laughs> to let go of customers. Yeah. Um, and I recommend everyone is like, you know, out of rate every single client you've got from a star from one to five, and the best clients, obviously, are five stars. The worst clients who are very demanding, they, they don't do the stuff that you want them to do, et cetera, et cetera, rate them as well, right? And mm-hmm. what you want to do is think about the characteristics and um, the maybe the, the mindset, the, the, you know, it could be for us, you know, how long they've been the job for. Are they uh, people who've got a family? You know, are they, uh, do they have this type of attitude? Like, really think about the characteristics of your best customers. Go and find more people like that you want to work with and let go of the shitty customers and you'll have yeah. a much better time in business. So, yeah, I think it's a great lesson. You, you, it's completely fine to let go. And obviously with the 10-bed HMO, you you obviously let go of that landlord, which is, yeah, respect to that. Yeah. Um, What would you say is like your vision for the future? You've got over 100, you know, properties that you're managing. What would you say is your kind of, your vision for you where do you want to see yourself in the next five years in your business in the next five years um i want to carry on sort of um progressing this in terms of just pushing with the process bringing those landlords on board um doing sort of more maintenance work because what we've got is we've got uh, three or four other agents who are sort of struggling with maintenance so we're taking i mean between them they've got probably about a thousand houses Wow. So we will take on uh, some of their maintenance stuff as well. Um, and then ideally, my, my aim is, is get a family member like my sister, someone who's more ex- who, not more experienced, but experienced in, in certain things and hand that over to her to deal with yep. while I just concentrate on bringing the business in and then speaking to people and bringing the clientele in. Ideally, landlord-wise yeah. yeah. is, is, is my aim. So in the next five years, if I can get to about 400 houses, well, I'll be happy with that. You know? hell, I'm yeah. aiming a bit higher than, you know, I'm not saying it's going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, but if you don't try, I'm not going to know what, what I, I am capable of doing, right? Um, so that's the aim. So I can, you know, see where I am at the end of the year. Yeah. And then start again next year. Amazing. Jay, what kind of makes you feel your best self? What inspires you, would you say? Um... I think with myself, right, I think just progress, um, progress, even if it's small progress, they, you know, you kind of say that even if you made a little bit of progress today, it doesn't have to be a massive, massive amount, right? Mm-hmm. But when you accumulate that over a year, a year and a half, two years, right, it's a massive amount, right? Mm-hmm. Um, even just doing bits, because before the mistake I used to make is I need to concentrate on this. I need to spend hours and hours on one thing to make yeah. progress, but that's not the case, right? Even, even with the shift to success thing, I'm like, I'm so busy renting the houses mm-hmm. that I'm not able to do certain things. But I'm like, what if I even spend an hour, hour and a half early in the morning doing this? Yeah. That's a little bit. Yeah. Over seven, 10 days, it adds up yeah. to about 15 hours, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which is better than zero hours. And yeah. I can still do what I'm doing. So that little bit of progress is 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 what sort of inspires me daily, even with when it comes to eating food, yeah, and trying to not eat unhealthy food or yeah. going to the gym. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely agree. Um, for sort of police officer like listening about your story and they know deep down they don't want to stay in the job. It's causing them some maybe mental health issues. They're not feeling valued, not feeling appreciated. Their stress levels are high. Their anxiety is there, impacting family life. What one bit of advice would you give to that police officer who is going through that and wants to build a business but is kind of worried and fearful? I think... I think when you're in any kind of job, right, including the police service, 
the, the wage is security, right? Um, and I, and I, I understand that for many people, including myself. But what I've realized most people will do when they finish work is they'll go home and they'll do nothing, mm. right? Either just chill with family thinking until their next shift, right? There's nothing, there's no in between there. So if you want to sort of do that transition, you will have to slowly build something on the side, right? Yeah. And when you start building that on the side, you've got another income coming in. What will happen is that income will soon generate more than what you're earning. Mm. So you can make a safe transition across if you need to. You can cut your hours here if you need to. Yeah. Um, within that time scale, you may have another idea, right? Yeah. Which will make you even more money. And then if you want to give that up, you can. Um, you can't just jump from one thing to another when it comes to business. I don't. I personally don't think it's got to be a calculated risk. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, with with people, you know, I know people in the job, really, really nice people who have suffered, like, you know, mental health, PTSD, and and loads of issues where they can't be frontline thing, and and a lot of it is caused by the not just the job itself, but the environment that they're in. You know, it's a harsh environment that we deal with on a daily basis. And you don't realize it, the stuff that you see, the stuff that you're told you deal with, mm. people being assaulted. Um, it's a lot for your sort of brain to take. Um, but if you want to make that transition, doing it slowly and having an idea and working on it, even if it's an hour a day, you'll see over time that will grow. Because that's what I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's smart. And a lot of people do that. It's a, it's a safer way of doing things. Um, and I always say, you know, sometimes we get the, the kind of, it's a bit of an excuse. Um, I haven't got the time I've got family, I've got this. And yet we see people who have got a family, you've got a family, you know, other people have got a family who do make the time. And, um, you know, if, if you don't make the time to do the things that, you know, you need to do to build the life you want, eventually you're going to be forced to deal with a life you don't want. And I think a lot yeah. of people in the police are struggling with, mental health issues, issues with pay, not retiring securely, you know, politics, bureaucracy, not seeing their family enough because they didn't find the time to build something on the side. And now they're being forced to deal with all the crap that the police brings them. Whereas if you just find the time, everyone can find the time to build something on the side. You've at least got that option. You've got that choice. And just knowing it's there is a very freeing feeling. You don't have to act on it and jump straight away, but just knowing it's there ticking in the background is a very, very, very nice feeling. And um, I always say too, you know, guys, if you can find 40 plus hours a week for the, for the job you dislike, but you can't find seven hours a week for the job for for your own business and your own dreams, you've got a serious problem. Um, it's, a, it's a big, big issue. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Even with the, the business now that I'm doing this full time, I could be out during the day and I'll come back and the clerical, so I could be working till one, two in the morning, right? Yeah. But then I'll say that Monday to Thursday, um, I'll work like loads of hours if I need to, especially if the demand is there with the houses coming in. Yeah. Friday, I'll take off Friday, Saturday and Sunday or I'll work half day Friday, you know? Yeah. So there's there's bits that you can give and take, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um. Hey Jay, where can people get to know uh, get to know you in terms of your business? Have you got a website? You have got your social media? Yeah, so basically, I've got the Facebook page, which yep. is on the JG Estates. Um, I put some of the properties on the inquiries through there. You've got the JG um, Estates website as well, um, where people can contact me. And obviously, Facebook is another thing for. Our members, I know there's people who are obviously you, you've given that big list of business ideas and whatnot. Yeah. And if there's people that you know want to just talk about the journey, you know, um, of how it is and what to sort of expect, because when I even when I started off, um, you know, it was it was difficult, it wasn't easy as mm -hmm. it is now. Because when you're established, it's much much easier. So they can make contact like that, and my numbers on there as well. Oh, awesome stuff, guy. Um, so Jay, the final question we like, we like to ask every single person who joins the Shift Success um, podcast is, for you personally, what does entrepreneurship mean to you? Um, for me, do something for yourself, right? Do something for yourself. We, every single person, I could, I could go around my block and speak to people. They'll be like, I've got a job here. I go to work here. I go to work here. Nine o'clock, I finish at five. Guess what? You're doing something for somebody else. Mm -hmm. right 
do something for yourself that's going to benefit you spend your time doing it right um and and basically being being good at it and building and and that's what it is um i if, if i look at myself I was good with the property thing. I learned more and I built on what I knew for myself, right? And I spent my time doing it. I know if I spend eight to 10 hours doing something I love than eight to 10 hours doing something I don't love, I'm going to get more out of it. Yeah, yeah. So that's basically what it means to me personally. I love that, Jay. Jay, I just want to say um, it's been an absolute pleasure to get you on the podcast. Um, I know it's been good this- speaking to you. No, it's, it's been amazing. And uh, I know this is your first one. I'm sure there's going to be plenty, plenty more. You have gained absolutely amazing success, you know, going from where you are in 2013 to gathering over, you know, a hundred plus um, properties is phenomenal. And, uh, you know, making the decision to resign and stand up for yourself, I think is absolutely amazing. Um, not being, you know, not feeling like you're being bullied and um, knowing that you've built that, you know, that get out of the job is really inspirational too. And I, and I believe so many people are going to take so much away from this podcast. So on behalf of myself and the team, we generally mean that we're really, really proud of all the success that you've gained so far. Again, this is just the beginning. Um, and I'm sure you are going to 110% hit that 400 unit mark for your property business. And uh, we can't wait to help you to get there. Um, Jay, thank you for your time. Guys, what's going to happen? This is going to be on the YouTube channel next week. And what we'll do is get this on the podcast so you can listen on the uh, in the gym or in the car or wherever you may be uh, via your phone on Spotify or Apple. And in the meantime, guys, we'll be seeing you all soon. Jay, thanks again. Thank you, Alex.